Kiki, okay. Kiki, Kiki. So it doesn't have anything to do with money, but I just wanna, you know, just thank Jesus for like what He's doing um, in my stepdad. Because um, like some like Mormons came and like tried to, you know, like tell him about Mormonism, and um. So that gave me the opportunity to like tell him the truth about Jesus, and I asked him if he you know wanted to like sit down one day and I could just like tell him more. So he's like super open. Ah! Jesus, amen. Okay, so I'm gonna welcome Meh, um, Pastor Hector. He's gonna give a really powerful word today. And I'm really, really, really excited to hear what the Lord spoke to him. Bear with me while I put this thing on. Huh? Excuse you? I couldn't hear you. You better think Jesus, I didn't hear you. Right? I mean, I'm not mean, it's, you know, if I don't fight with some of y'all, it means that I love y'all. Hi, everybody. Can we just take a quick moment to close our eyes and just breathe? And let's remember that this is all about the Lord. This is all about the Lord. So now ask the Lord to speak to you specifically, to give you a specific word because he has a word prepared. But he wants us to be willing to receive. Matthew 7, 7 says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. So ask the Father right now right now in that intimacy that you've developed that you've worked on with him just ask him lord tell me something speak to me speak to me tell me what i need to hear today remember this is all about him jesus we praise you we ask you father that you speak to us today in a new way god in a powerful powerful way god Every time that I'm up here, I pray and I say the same thing. I am simply a tool for you to use, God. But this is about you. This is about showing your glory, God. So I pray today that you speak through me, God, that from the moment my, my, my feet step on this stage, God, that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, that you will speak through me, God, that you will give a personal word to each and every single person here, God. So I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? This might be a little bit, a tiny, a tiny bit long, but it's, it's important, it's thick, it's deep. Um, so who knows what our theme for this year is? Who knows what our theme for the year is? It is only the beginning. Like Kyle, I'm not gonna steal that from pastor. That's pastor's preaching to give, um, but what, as I was praying, as I was praying to ask the Lord um, what he wanted to bring today, um, it was like he was telling me, I got to prepare my children to receive that word. So, so today, right, the, the word that the Lord has given to me is to prepare for that, to prepare for the new beginnings he has in store for us, right? I don't know if you guys, there's, there's two scriptures that are going to be like the main theme of today. Now, I'm going to tell you the theme, but I'm going to tell you the scriptures first. So the first one is Isaiah 43, 19. This one actually pastor posted it on his Facebook and his Instagram. Isaiah 43, 19. In New King James Version, it says, Behold, I will do a new thing, and it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. 
in another translation, in New Living Translation, it says, for I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. So that's one, right? That's one scripture that's going to be the main theme of today. The second scripture that's going to be the main theme of today is John 10. John 10, verses 2 through 5. New King James says, But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. He goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So, I'm going to introduce first before I give you a theme. God wants to and will do a new, new and unimaginable things in us this year and through us. But we have to be bold to respond to him. He is the one that will make a way and walk before us. And we know that. But when it, comes to, when it comes to following, right, we often question him before we follow. We ask, when he, when he calls us to do something new, we ask, are you sure? Do you really want me to teach? Do you really want me to lead? Is that, is that really something that you have for me? Do you want me to use a diagram to evangelize? Like, actually, because there's other ways to evangelize. Or, for example, a place that I found myself in. God, I don't have the time to join a, the dance ministry, right? Even though I love it. Um, I can't come to Sunday morning revival because I woke up, I wake up er- early every other day of the week, right? How am I going to juggle school, work, and ministry, right? These are the questions that, that, that we have, right? The, the, the questions that we direct to God when he asks us to do a new thing, when he asks us to be more involved, when he asks us to, to, to trust in him more, right? And here's, here's a couple more, right? Um, like when you, when you struggle with school, work, and ministry, you think, I have to do less in at least one of them to keep up with everything else, right? Or, I mean, I do enough in the church. I don't have to join a new ministry. I'm not a student. Why should I be involved in the college ministries, right? Or, God, I know you've placed this desire in my heart to start this new ministry, but I just can't right now. It's, it's just not the time right now. You know, like, like, I have too much going on. I don't know how to start it. I have no idea. I mean, like, how would I even, like, how, how, right? How do you want me to get there? I have no idea, right? Have you ever, have any of you ever told God or asked God any of these questions? I know I have, for sure. Have you questioned how qualified you are to do what he asked you? I have many, many, many times. As confident as I seem sometimes, I've questioned God so many times in my life. Let me take this out of the way. I've questioned God so many times in my life and asked him, are you sure? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't don't think I have enough time or I don't see myself doing that. If we want to experience a year of new things, and new beginnings, we have to be willing to follow him in boldness wherever he leads us. So the theme for today is walk in boldness if you want to experience a new thing. Walk in boldness if you want to experience a new thing. You got that down? Point one. Being bold is not a leap of faith. Being bold is not 
Felipe fez. For those of us that have been here for a while, we've heard preaching after preaching after preaching from pastor talking about faith from God, right? When God asks us to do something, he gives us the faith to follow through with the plan that he's already set into motion, right? If we go to Mark 11, 22 through 24, this is one of the main scriptures that pastor uses for this. Mark 11, 22 through 24. And I'm going to mention a lot of scriptures, so I don't know if you'll have time to like go to each one, so just make sure that you write the, the title of each scripture down or like what scripture I'm reading. So Mark 11, 22 through 24. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. The Greek, literal Greek translation says, have faith from God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that th those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. We need to have faith from God. This is different from a leap of faith, right? Because a leap of faith is when you have to take a, a step in a direction that you're not 100% confident in. It's, it's to say that you have an idea of what you think that God wants you to do, and then you just, you jump towards it. You, you give everything that you have towards that one idea, right? But you have no confirmation. You have no rema yet. God hasn't told you, go. Maybe God's placed a little bit of a desire in your heart. Maybe it's just something that you want, but you haven't prayed about. Or maybe you've already made a decision, and now you're asking God to bless it. That's a leap of faith. Being bold is not a leap of faith. It's different because we're bold when Christ calls us. He calls us first. He leads us, right? What was I saying in John? John 10, 2 through 5. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. He calls to you first, right? He calls you by name, and he goes before you. He sets the path for you to walk. And so being bold for Christ is to walk that path that he's already set out for you, no matter how many obstacles you see in your way. One point two, actually. One point one is faith from God. One point one is faith from God. One point one is faith from God. One point two is he calls us by name. 1.2 is he calls us by name. He knows who we are and what we are capable of. He created us. So when he asks you to do something new and outside of your comfort zone, he knows full well that you may and will struggle. In fact, you can even say that because he lives outside of time, he already knows all of the ways that you will succeed and fail in doing what he's already asked you to do. But you know what the, you know what the funny thing is? He asks you to do it anyways. Have you ever thought about that? God knows everything, absolutely everything. And he, asks, and he asks you to step out in faith, right? By his rema, he's leading you somewhere. And then all of these insecurities start to come up, all of these thoughts, all of these doubts start to come up, and all of these reasons start to come up. God already knows every reason that you could ever give him to not do what he's asked you to do. He already knows every struggle that you're going to face along the way. But he calls you by name. That means he calls you by your identity, by who he sees you as, the completed person that you are in Christ. And he says, I still want you to do it. I know you're going to struggle, but I still want you to do it. I know you're insecure, but I still want you to do it. I know you're not the best at evangelism, but I still want you there talking to people because there's something that I have to teach you. There's something that I have to show you about myself, about my character. 
to show you that it's not about you, but it's about me. It's about him. It's always about him. If he asks you to step out in faith, knowing full well that you will struggle and you might break, that should tell you something. 1.3. He is our confidence because he goes before us. He is our confidence because he goes before us. Verse 4 of, of John 10 again says, And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, and they know his voice. Any obstacle that you will ever encounter, be it lack of knowledge when evangelizing, courage when preaching, confidence in your identity, resistance from those around you who you would speak to about Jesus, lack of time, lack of focus, lack of motivation, lack of drive, lack of heart, or embarrassment, whatever it may be, whatever obstacle that you will ever encounter, he has already conquered. He has already conquered it for you. That's what it means for him to set a path, right? I don't remember if Kyle was saying this in, in the preaching last Sunday, but he was giving like this image of like he was, he was, he was in a secret place, right? And then there was Jesus, and, and, and in front of Jesus, there was like a barrier, right? You remember that, Kyle? It was like a barrier, right? And that barrier blocked everything that was coming his way, right? And then what did you say? You said suddenly at one point, Jesus just zoomed way past you, and he left a path. He cleared the way. That is exactly how it is with God. Whenever he asks you to do something, It's because he's already seen you do it in the invisible. He's called you to it, and he's set a path for you. And the obstacles obstacles that he's left in the way are for your benefit, for your growth, for you to get closer to him. I'm going to read a couple verses to you guys just to put this in perspective. Romans 8. We're going to read a lot of verses from Romans 8. Romans 8. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Verse 28, and we know that all things, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is God who justifies. If God calls you to something, don't care what anybody else has to say about it because his word is so much more important than anything that anybody around you could ever say. In verses 35, 39, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is the everlasting love of God that drives us, it fuels us. We do everything for his glory. Nothing can separate us from his eternal love. No measure of tribulation, nothing 
Nothing can separate you from that which you need the most, that which you already have, God's love for you. God's love for you. That's what leads us forward. That's what leads us to be bold. It's because we love him that we dare to challenge ourselves when he challenges us and we step forward in faith from him to do what he's called us to do. It's because of his love. Thank you, sister. Point two. And this one's really important. Be bold enough to have the right heart. Be bold enough to have the right heart. I'm going to read a lot more scriptures. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Again, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Everything you do, do as unto the Lord. Everything you do, do as unto the Lord and not to men. Think about that. Process that. Let it sink in. Everything you do, do as unto the Lord. Everything. That means that if God is asking you to step out in boldness, you're doing it for him, not for yourself, not for anybody around you. When God asks you to serve within a specific ministry, you're not doing it because you like it. Even if you do love it, you're not doing it because you like it. You're doing it because you're obeying him, because you love him. If God is asking you to teach, you don't teach because you like it. You don't teach because somebody asked you to. You teach because God called you to. If you evangelize, you don't evangelize because our vision is to evangelize, because pastor calls us to evangelize. You evangelize because he called you to. If you're discipling somebody, You're not doing it because you like to help people. You're not doing it, or you shouldn't be doing it, because you enjoy the process of seeing people grow. You should do it because Jesus asks you to first and foremost, before everything else. Everything else is secondary. Everything else comes after that. If you like it, if you love it, if you hate it, if you despise it, whatever it is, you do it because God asks you to first. And verse 24 says, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. You see, Christ calls us to not look at temporary rewards. He calls us to look at the eternal reward, right? He tells us to have this heart of don't do anything because of instant gratification as our generation normally does things, right? Why do you watch YouTube videos? Oh, because it's, it, it just feels nice. Why do you watch that TV show? Oh, I mean, it just, it keeps me entertained, right? Why do you do drugs? It's a quick fix. Why do you drink alcohol? I just can't deal with my, with my thoughts, you know? So I just, I, I mean, I have, to, I have to do something. Why do you smoke weed? Oh, it helps me relax whenever I feel, you know, on edge, right? That's what the world says. But Christ tells us to look at the eternal reward that we're going to receive from him. Because we will receive a reward for having the right heart. We will receive a reward for everything that we do for him. Because everything that we do for ourselves, we're going to lose. 100% definitely. Everything that you love more than God, you will lose. Everything, everything, everything. And I experienced that. 
because there came a point in 2021 where I loved my ministry and I loved teaching more than I loved God. And what did God do? My disciples know. Took them away for a season. I had to go deep in prayer and fasting to check my heart. And if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't be standing here today. I wouldn't be a part of this church right now. That's a fact. The team especially knows that. Because I loved my ministry and I loved what I was doing more than I loved God. And I did it for me because I liked it. So everything you do, do is unto the Lord. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 18. First Corinthians 12, 12 through 18. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, the body is not one member, but many if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleases. I don't know if you guys understand that. Um, every single one of you is important here. Every single one of you. I don't care how long you've been in this ministry. I don't care how involved you are. I don't care how not involved you are. Every single one of you is essentially important to this ministry, and every single one of you moves this ministry forward. It's not just the team. It's not just the leaders. Every single one of you has an important role here. And I challenge you to not despise your role, no matter how small it seems. To give you an example, I don't know if you guys know, but Kiara back there always helps me every Sunday. Always. And Freddie now is helping me. But Kiara is always back there helping me. She's always there doing the live, right? She's always in the background. Does anybody notice that? She's really, really, really quiet. Does anybody notice that? Does anybody know how hard she works back there? Does anybody have an idea how hard she works back there? I'm going to challenge you and say, no, you don't. Because <laughs> you haven't been back there. You don't know everything that she has to do every single Sunday to make sure that everything works. Just today, we were missing the worship portion because our internet wasn't working. She had to resolve that. And Freddie helped. <laughs> like I said, Freddie's there to help now. Freddie's there with me. Thank you. My brother. Yeah. Did you know that though? Are you guys ever aware of the technical problems that we have on Sundays? Some of you do. Some of you do, right? You guys ever notice when this thing doesn't work? Or when the camera doesn't work? No? Ah, what about when the sound doesn't work? Not everybody's paying as much attention as, as some of us are, right? Every single part of the body is essential. I don't care how small your role seems. Every single part of the body is essential. All of us are part of one body, the body of Christ. At times, the Lord asks us to serve the body in ways that we never imagined we would. I never thought I would lead the social media ministry. Never. In my entire life, I never had even the slightest clue that I would get to lead some sort of social media ministry. But that's what I'm doing now because that's what the Lord called me to. Not because I like it, not because I love it, because it's not my favorite thing to do, but I do it because the Lord has called me to, because the Lord has asked me to, because there is a need in the body that needs to be fulfilled. Somebody needs to step up. Somebody needs to do that job. Am I going to wait for somebody else to take that role? Or am I going to be proactive in my relationship with Jesus and respond to that need, no matter how small? 
Sometimes the Lord even asks us to willingly serve in ways that we would not like to, or in ways and ministries that we may not be completely passionate about. Let me give you another example. You guys see me every Sunday play bass, right? I started playing bass because I want to learn all of the instruments back here, and that's a lot, and that's going to take a couple years. But I want to learn all of the instruments back here because I want to be able to teach this to the next generation, right? There came a point where I was playing in my secret place more acoustic guitar than, than bass, and I was despising the position that God put me in. And I was thinking to myself, God, why don't you give me more opportunities to lead worship? Why don't you give me more opportunities to play the acoustic guitar? That's the main instrument that I love. That's what I want to do, right? And you know what the Lord told me? You're not in that stage because you want to be there. You're not in that stage because I need you there. Or because, I mean, you're not in that stage because I want you there or because I need you there, because you want to be there especially. You're in that stage because I told you to, because I called you to. I'm the one that put that base in your hands. It wasn't you. It wasn't just because you saw a need and you decided to jump at the, at the occasion. I told you to and you obeyed. And he also told me, you don't choose your main instrument. I do because you're doing it for me. You're not doing it for yourself. Just heads up, Norma. I'm going to take a minute. Um... And so, when we follow him and serve in his body, in any ministry or capacity, we need to have a deep understanding that we are doing this for him and not for ourselves. And when we work for God, we give him our best. We give 110% of ourselves to everything he places in our hands, not focusing on the personal sense of fulfillment we get, but rather focusing on the reward we have in him and the one we will receive in heaven. So I'm pretty sure this year God is going to challenge some of you, if not all of you, to serve in ways that you're not comfortable with, to serve in ways that you kind of don't see yourself doing, to serve in ways that you don't feel really passionate about. But why are you here? Are you here because you like to be here? Are you here because this is a good social scene? Are you here because you have friends? Are you here because it makes you feel good? Or are you here because of Jesus? Who was the one that saved you? Was it pastor? Was it your conversations at pastor, with pastor that brought you here? Or was it your own relationship with Christ that brought you here? Why are you here? Why are you here? And so serve him with 110% of yourself. It doesn't matter if your role seems or insignificant or if it's frustrating. He's the one that called you to it. You're not doing it because pastor told you to, because your discipler told you to. You're not doing it because there's a need. God can use anybody. He doesn't need you to do his work. He wants you to do his work. He doesn't need you to make his kingdom run. His kingdom pretty much runs by itself, and he asks us to, he wants us to be a part of the process. But whatever blessing he, he, whatever blessing he wants to give you and you don't want, he's going to give it to somebody else. Serving in any kind of minister here is a blessing, a ginormous blessing, because you're helping the body of Christ move forward. So, point three. Point three. And this is my last point. To be bold, you need to be intimate. To be bold, you need to be intimate. If you're here because of Jesus, and you're here to serve Jesus, can't really do that if you don't talk to him. Can't really do that if you don't communicate with him. Can't really do that if you don't have a relationship with him. John 15, verses 4 and 5. These are my favorite verses in Scripture, verse 5 especially. John 15, 4 and 5, Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you, 
as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. And listen to this. This is a really important part. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Now listen, for without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. I'm constantly in this place in my heart, in my secret place. When I talk to Jesus, when I come up here and I teach, when I, when I teach the, the, the university, I constantly tell God, God, I can't. God, I don't know. I, I'm not capable. I don't have the ability to. It doesn't matter if I have a gift. It doesn't matter if I'm good at, 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 at public speaking. It doesn't matter if I'm good at understanding what the word of God says. I don't have the ability to. I'm useless without him. Every single gift that I have, every ability that I have to be up there to preach and teach is because he's given it to me. If he decides to, give it, to take it away, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. He completes me, though. Right? It's not about the gifts completing you. It's about him completing you, but that's a side note. But the important thing is that he is the vine. We are the branches. He who abides in him bears much fruit. For without him, we can do absolutely nothing. Jesus builds his church. We don't. Jesus builds ministries. We don't. New image was created by Jesus, by a desire that he placed in somebody's heart and made flourish. If God asks you to move in a certain direction that is scary or uncomfortable for you, how much time do you spend in secret place about it? How much do you talk to God about what he asks of you? How much do you ask him to give you the right heart, the right tools, and pave the way for you? If he asks you to serve in a certain ministry, Kyle and Norma especially know this, you got to pray for people at USF, right, Kyle? And what happens if you don't pray for people at USF? Norma, what happens if you don't pray before you go to evangelize? Nothing. Nothing. For without him, we can do nothing. He drives us. He leads us. He paves the way. We don't pave the way. We got to ask him, Jesus, where do you want me to be? Jesus, where do you want me to go? Jesus, how do you want me to evangelize? Jesus, who do you want me to talk to? Jesus, bring people to me. Bring people to me that need you, that are desperate for you. Because you're not going to find them. You're not able to. Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Do you ask for his will to be done in your life? Genuinely ask yourself that question. Do you ask for his will to be done in your life? Do you ask him to reveal his will for you and help you follow it? Because it's one thing to ask him what he wants of you, and it's another thing to ask him to help you follow that. Because the standard is perfection, and that's impossible for us. Do you ask him to help you? When he asks you to do something that's hard, uncomfortable, or seems impossible, he does so to stretch your faith and trust in him. He does so to reveal his character to you and take you closer and closer to him. Because you see, you can get close to somebody in the good times, when you're happy, when you're joyful, when everything is going good, but somebody's character is tested when the hard times come. Those of you that are married know that, especially. 
right? Somebody's heart is shown in the lows and the deep lows where nobody else seems to be willing to be there, where nobody else understands, where not even the person you care about understands, that's when somebody's heart is shown, right? And so think about this in the context of your relationship with Jesus. When you are at your lowest is when his character shines the most. I heard a preacher say once that the closer that you get to God, the more sinful you see yourself as because you see more and more and more of his glory and his majesty and his power, right? And so when you go through trial after trial after trial after trial, know that it is God calling you to a deeper level of intimacy than you've ever experienced before. And now you can neither let this trial shape you or break you. How are you going to respond when God calls you? Are you going to say, Lord, shape me. Lord, help me. Lord, show me your character. Lord, I don't understand the pain and suffering that I'm going through. I don't understand the situations that I'm going through. But show me your glory in the midst of this. Lord, how can I serve you? How can I, how can I be here, God, and do your work on this earth? What else can I learn from you? What can I learn from this situation about you? Because it's all about you. It's not about my pain. It's not about my suffering. It's not about my hardships. It's about what you want to teach me in the midst of all of this. It's about where you want to lead me. It's about what you want to do in me. It's about how you want to transform me. Because the beautiful thing about Jesus is that when, when you're in a relationship, in fellowship with Jesus, that word is powerful. When you are in a deep fellowship with Christ, that means that everything that you have, you give to him. You surrender to him everything at every moment of your life. And everything that he has, he's actually already surrendered to you and given to you on the cross. Everything that he has a right to, you have a right to. That's why we're called children of God, not because we are literal children of God, but because we are adopted into his family through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gives us the right to be treated as children and to treat God as a father. So he calls us deep intimacy. And like I was saying, the beautiful thing is that you give Jesus everything that you have and he gives you everything that he has. But what else do you have to give but filthy rags? What can you give that is on equal value as what he's already given you? Nothing. Nothing. There is nothing that you could ever give to him that will ever match the price that he paid. And so what happens? Everything that you give to him, everything that you can give to him is your sin. It's your inconsistency. It's your lack of heart. It's your lack of discipline. It's everything that is weak about you. But you know what the beautiful thing is? Because in him there is no sin. When you give it to him, he burns it up in the fire. And all he has to give you is good. All he has to give you is beautiful. All he has to give you is life, right? What does John 10, 10 say? The thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly, right? So I'm going to ask everybody to stand. I want everybody to stand and close your eyes. I'm going to ask you, how will you respond when God calls you to do something that you're uncomfortable with, when God calls you to places that you don't like, when God calls you to step out in faith in ways that are extremely uncomfortable to you? What are you going to do? How are you going to respond when God challenges you what are you going to do when God points at your inconsistencies? What are you going to do 
How are you going to respond? Will you decide to let this situation make you or break you? Are you going to let God shape you in the midst of what's happening? Or are you going to let this situation break you? Whatever it is that he's putting you through, whatever it is that he's asking you for, what is he calling you to? Kiki, can you put some more shit? How will you respond and what is he calling you to? Take a moment yourself to ask God, what are you calling me to do? What are you calling me to do? Is there a ministry that you want me to serve in? Is there something in my heart that I haven't given to you yet? Am I inconsistent? Am I not as close to you as, as I think? Because you can always get closer to him. What is the Lord calling you to do? Ask him. Ask him, God, what are you calling me to do? What do you want from me? What do you want me to do? Because what you want me to do is so much more important than anything that I would ever want myself to do, God. Your dreams for me are so much greater than my dreams for myself. My dreams for myself, they can't match the abundance of your glory. They don't match. They don't match. They don't match. Is he calling you to let go of your fears? Is he calling you to let go of your fears? What are you afraid of? What are you so afraid of? If God is calling you forward, is God a, if God is calling you to deeper intimacy, if God is calling you to study the word even deeper than you already have before, if God is calling you to teach, if God is calling you to worship, if God is calling you to dance, what are you so afraid of? Ask him that. Ask him to reveal it to you. Lord, is there anything that I'm afraid of? Is there anything that I'm holding in my heart, God? that I need to give to you, that I need to surrender to you, that I haven't yet. Lord, take me closer. Lord, take me deeper. Let that be your prayer. It's about intimacy. If there's anything I want you to take from this, from, from this teaching, it's intimacy. Intimacy will lead you. Intimacy will drive you. Intimacy will take you to places where you never imagined yourself you, that you could be. Is there anything that you fear? Take that fear, whatever it may be. Take that fear and surrender it to him. Let it go in his hands. Let him be the one to comfort you. Let him be the one to encourage you. Let him be the one to be your confidence. Don't have confidence in yourself and your own ability to do anything because without him, you can do nothing. Instead, say, Jesus, I want you to be my confidence. Jesus, I want you to make me confident in you. Because David beat Goliath, not because he was confident in himself, but because he was confident in the Lord. Because he spent an abundance of, 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 of time. He spent so much time in God's presence. Fighting and fighting and fighting. Spiritual battles and physical battles for the sheep that God gave him. And he knew if God delivered me from the, from, from, from the lion and from the bear, I know that he'll deliver you into my hand. Let God be your confidence. Let God give you the confidence that you need to step out in boldness, in faith from him. He's already called you. That means that he's already conquered. There is no obstacle that you have to take on by yourself. Jesus says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He's already taken all of your burdens on that cross. You have no right to hold on to those burdens. No right. You have no right to hold on to those burdens. Ask him, Jesus, do you want me to serve you in a new way? Do you want me to serve you in a new way? Ask him to check your heart to see if where he's already called you to serve if you're doing it with the right heart or you're doing it because you like it or you're doing it because somebody called you to because somebody asked you to because somebody needs you to do that job is he placing a desire in your heart to start a new ministry is he because if he is you got to take it to secret place and let him be the one 
to do the work. Let him be the one to do the heavy lifting. All you got to do is pray and go deep in your own relationship with him. Let him mold you. Let him make everything happen.